Okay, this is a lecture for my uh, fifth hour U.S. history class. Uh, so, uh, anyway, we left off the Gettysburg Address. The Battle of Gettysburg was fought on July 1st, 2nd, and 3rd, 1863, around a little farm town in southern Pennsylvania for three days, 165,000 men. Yes, question. Okay, uh, 165,000 men fought around this little town, and... Uh, uh, 56,000 of them were killed and wounded. One of the worst episodes, one of the worst uh, battles of the war, one of the worst uh, uh, events in human history. But when it was over, Robert E. Lee was defeated and he was forced to go back to the South and he never invaded the North again. In fact, Lee has two, uh, invades two, uh, Lee invades two times. He invades the North twice. And uh, both times are failures. Uh, the second time is Gettysburg, and like I say, he never, he never invades the North again. Um, of course, the whole thing culminated around a bit called uh, an event called Pickett's Charge on the third day of the battle, when George Pickett led fifteen thousand men across uh, an open field, and seventy five hundred of them were mowed down in about uh, killed and wounded. They weren't all killed, but seventy five hundred of them were mowed down in about thirty minutes. Uh, and so uh, when it was all over, there were dead bodies everywhere. And of course, Gettysburg turned into a mass grave. And they petitioned the United States government asking them for permission to make Gettysburg into a national cemetery, which is what it is today. And uh, the government granted them permission. And so they, you know, the battle was on July of 1863, July, August, September, October, November. Five months later, on November the 19th, they dedicated the cemetery. And of course, this was such an important event that uh, they wanted to get, uh, you know, the finest speaker that they could. And so they invited a man who may have been the most brilliant man in America, maybe the most brilliant man in the world, a guy named Edward Everett. And Ed Edward Everett stood up and he spoke for two and a half hours. And essentially he talked about the history of the United States. But then when he was done, Abraham Lincoln got up and spoke that little paragraph right there. Nobody knows who Edward Everett. Edward Everett was, you do now, but nobody knows him, and nobody knows really much of what he said. But Lincoln's words will never be forgotten. You know, one of the jobs of a president is to be the comforter-in-chief. When something bad happens, presidents go there. Uh, you have a picture of Barack Obama over there, and when he was president, a, a horrible a hurricane hit New Jersey and New York City, and he's one of the first people on the ground there to comfort Americans, regardless of their politics, regardless of if they voted for him or not. He's there as a symbol that the government cares. Uh, we just have had a, uh, when, when Donald Trump was president, they had a hurricane that hit Florida. He's one of the first people on the ground. And of course, right now we have a hurricane that's ravaged Florida and, uh, and uh, Puerto Rico, which is by the way, a um, Puerto Rico, I can't, up, uh, not a province, but anyway, a commonwealth of the United States, and Joe Biden has been there to comfort them. Well, by 1863, this war had turned into a bloodbath. Everybody had thought it would be one battle, then it would be over, either the North would win or the South would win, uh, and uh, the country could go on about its business. But by 1863, uh, through a series of battles, including things like Shiloh and, and uh, Antietam and Gettysburg itself, this war had turned into a bloodbath, and a lot of people were uh, willing to give up. A lot of people were saying, yes, yeah, slavery's horrible, but it's not, you know, the ending slavery's not worth what it's costing the country. Yeah, you know, with, yeah, yeah, we would like to be one country, but saving the union just isn't worth it. We love the union, but it's not worth what it's costing us. And so one of the reasons that Lincoln decided to go to Gettysburg is because the nation was looking for answers. They were looking to the president. Mr. President, tell us why this sacrifice that we're having to make is uh, so drastic. Why are we uh, going through this? And uh, that's what Lincoln sought to do when he gave the Gettysburg Address. And you need to get that down. You know, when, when everybody that makes a speech, they have a purpose. I'm speaking to you. This is not a speech. It's a lecture. I'm speaking to you. I'll repeat what I said, but I'm speaking to you right now. I've got a purpose. My purpose is to let you know what the Gettysburg Address says. So, so Lincoln goes down to Gettysburg. This is what you need to have down. He goes down to Gettysburg to tell the American people why this great sacrifice, 
that the American people are currently in, that, that, that the American people were currently uh, uh, being called upon to make by this great sacrifice, by all this blood. You can write that in a thousand different ways. You don't have to quote me. While they were having to make this great sacrifice. And so he tells them this in this speech. So uh, anyway, Lincoln said, four score, he started his speech. For the Gettysburg Address, two minute speech, a paragraph long. He said, four score and seven years ago, our fathers, we talked about the four fathers. Can, can anybody name me a founding father of America? Who? George Washington. George Washington. Can, that may be the most important one, maybe. Who's another one? Um, Who? Samuel Adams. Samuel Adams. I wasn't thinking of him. And his cousin John. Yes. Samuel Adams, by the way, well, anyway. Good enough. Samuel Adams. Anybody else? Think of the men who created this country? Well, 55 of them. Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson. Who? Hamilton. Alexander is one of my favorites. They're still, they're still, you know, you think somebody's going to be uh, producing a musical about your life 250 years from today? They're still doing that for Hamilton. Pretty important guy. Anyway, Alexander Hamilton, I'll tell you this. If Alexander Hamilton had had his way, there would not have been slavery. The, the, the Constitution would have abolished slavery in 1787, and there wouldn't have been a civil war. But that's another topic for another day. He's very important. Benjamin Franklin. Yeah, those are all founders. Okay. Uh, well, anyway, uh, so Lincoln starts out by saying four score and seven years ago, the founders, the people who created this country, brought forth upon this continent. A new nation, conceived, write down that word conceived, conceived, if you don't have it already, we may have done this yesterday. Did we do it yesterday? Yes, sir. Conceived, conception, you're all here by a process of conception. That's how you got here. It's birth, conceived. <clears throat> Four score and seven years ago, our forefathers gave birth to a new nation on this continent. It was, it was uh, birthed in liberty, and dedicated to an idea. That's what a proposition is, that all men are created equal. Uh, Mr. Uh, Hunter, where, where do you find those words, all men are created equal? What's the name of the document? There are only two documents we've talked about. I'm giving you a chance to redeem yourself from that grievous error you made a while ago. What are you laughing about? What is it? <laughs> You're on deck. What? What is it? What? Declaration. Yes. Write that down. Yeah, Declaration. Right down. And, and so Lincoln, Lincoln, listen, in that sentence, Lincoln identifies the beginning of America. He says America began with the Declaration of Independence. Now, I'm here to tell you that that's not true. Lincoln was wrong, uh, in my opinion. Uh, this right here, these four pages... Constitution of the United States in 1787, Declaration of Independence written in 1776, 1787. This was the beginning of America. If I could clap my hands and bring Lincoln back here, and he would appear six foot four there in the stovepipe hat, uh, he would point at me and say, I don't want any of you young Americans to listen to him. He's wrong. The, America, the United States did not begin with the Constitution. It began with the Declaration of Independence. Lincoln said that America was created by the Declaration of Independence. I think he was wrong, but Lincoln's given the speech, not me. So he said they created a new nation, and they dedicated that nation to an idea. Ideas are powerful things. All men are created equal. Look at the next line. Read along with me, not out loud. I said that one time, the whole class started reading. But anyway, now we are engaged in a great civil war. Testing whether that nation, the nation founded by the founding fathers, how many years ago? Uh, 87, 87, 87 years ago. The, he said, what's the reason for this war? The American people want to know. Number one, it's a test. Get that down. It's a test. Lincoln's going to, going to answer to the American people, why are, you, why are we having to fight this bloody horrible war? It's a test. It's a test whether the nation that was founded 87 years ago or any nation based on the idea that all men are created equal can long endure. You with me? Yes? Yes, sir. Good. So that's number one. This is a test. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. 
And we've come here to dedicate a piece of that battlefield as a final resting place to those who here gave their lives that the nation might live. And it's all together fitting. It's a good thing that we are doing that. But in a larger sense, in other words, if you step back and look at the big picture, in a larger sense, we the living, we can't dedicate. But by the way, write that word down, consecrate. Write this word down, hallow, consecrate. He said, we've come here to dedicate a cemetery to honor those men who died here. But he said, if you step back and look at the big picture, he said, we cannot consecrate. We the living, we who didn't fight here, we cannot consecrate. We cannot hallow this ground. What does consecrate mean? Huh? No. Never say this. You don't have a clue. You got all kind of. You know what that? I'm not saying you're saying this, but you know what? You know when you say that, people say that guy's saying I'm stupid. I don't have any. You got all kinds of ideas. What does consecrate mean? I, I, Hurry! I'm going to retire in two years. I'd like to hear this answer. Um. Quick. Jump, jump. Do you know? No, that's an educated guess. What does consecrate mean? Wait, we aren't done. What does hallow mean? We cannot hallow this ground. <laughs> Somebody go out and reset the sundial. Uh, I'm just kidding. I figure you often take, have a sense of humor. We've always got some toad frog that wakes up pissed off at the world every day. I probably should have said that, so I'll take that. Uh, I'm not telling you to take your hat off. You'll go down, well, well, you know, you're so good. I was always a little kid. You said that, and now I want to kill my little brother. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> write, write that down in the back of your notebook that I said that and put a date on it, you know, so you can, you and your lawyer can use that at the school board meeting. <laughs> I'll retire to the madhouse. Anyway. Back to what I was saying, what does hallowed ground mean? What does it mean? Yeah. What? Dug up. No. no. That's okay. It's okay. When I say no, you just don't know what it is. You ought to hear things you don't know every day in school. What about you in the peanut gallery back there? Uh, I mean, is, is your dad John? Yeah. Oh, I taught him. Right. He used to sit right up front. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he was a good student. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Tell him I said hello. You know, you never know. Someone, person sitting there, you know, they got their lawyer, or worse than that, their mother on speed. Oh, mother, who said this? I'm going to jump down the staircase. Don't jump down the staircase. I'm just kidding. Anyway, what do you think? Like, make it holy? Is that, like, make it like a cemetery almost? Say that again. I mean, like a sim, like a holy cemetery. Make it holy. Yeah. You think that's what like, consecrate means? No, like hollow. Hollow. Yeah, hollow. Well, they mean the same thing. Is that what you're saying it means? Yeah. Hmm. Put your head down. You <laughs> no, you're absolutely right. Way to go. Write that down. It means to make holy. Yeah. What'd you say? I said good job, Richie. What? I said good job, Richie. Oh, great. <laughs> anyway, he said, we're here to dedicate this. But he said, you know what? We, the living, we don't have the power to make this place holy. Are you with me? We don't have the power to make this place holy. Now, look at the next line. He says, the brave men living and dead who struggled here have made this ground holy far above. Far, far above our poor power. To add to what they did or take away. We, the living, can't make this ground holy. The men who fought and died here have done that. The world, and boy, here's where Lincoln makes a big mistake. People always laugh. The world will little note or long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. This is the most remembered speech in history. As long as, listen, as long as, as language is printed on a page or a screen, the Gettysburg Address will endure it. Everything else may pass away, but this one, you're big mistake. Now look at this. So if we, the living, we who didn't fight here, can't make this ground holy, what can we do? Get this down. He said, "It is don't copy this, but put it in your own words. It is for us, the living, 
to be dedicated here to the unfinished work that the men who fought here have so nobly advanced. What, madam, is the unfinished work? What's he talking about? What's the unfinished work? He said, we the living have to dedicate ourselves to finish the unfinished work that these men left who fought and died here. What, what is he talking about? Um. <laughs> what do you think? What? You know, that's okay. Uh, well, you know more than him. He thinks Lincoln's talking about the Constitution. So, anyway. <laughs> what does that mean? Uh, they're trying to bring the country back together. Right. That save the what? Save the Union. And what else was the goal of the war by this time? So he said, these guys, these guys advanced the cause of saving the Union and ending slavery, but they died. So somebody has to pick up the mantle and continue the work. And finish the work. You understand that? The unfinished work. And he said, you know whose job that is? Us. We the living. You understand this? You understand what I'm saying? Yes? Yes, sir. Yes? Tell me if you don't. Because if we don't do anything this year except get you to understand the Gettysburg Address, our time has been well spent. I assure you of that. It is rather for us here to be dedicated to the great task remaining before us. What is the great task remaining before us? Save the union and end slavery. He said the men who died here did all they could, but now we have to take up the fight. We can't make this ground holy, but we can take up the fight. <clears throat> it is for us here to be dedicated to the great task remaining before us that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to the cause which they here gave their last full measure of devotion. He said we have got to become increasingly, listen, devoted. We have to increase our devotion to the cause that they gave their life for. That's the last full measure. If you give your life, you can't give anything else. And uh, and uh, what is the great task remaining before us? To complete the union. To save the union save the and enslave. And we have to do that regardless of how bloody this war, regardless of how much sacrifice it takes. We have to do it. <clears throat> that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not die in vain. If we don't finish, if we don't save this union and we don't end slavery, the lives of everyone who fought to save this country will have been in vain. That means they died for nothing. He said that we here highly resolve that these men shall not have died in vain. We are going to save this union. Don't do that. Don't do that. We're going to save this union, and we're going to end slavery. That this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom. You see that? He starts out talking about birth. By the way, is birth painful? Yes. 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 What in the world would you know about it? Ladies, is birth painful? Yes. Is birth bloody? Yeah. Yes. Was this war painful or was it bloody? Yeah. Yes. He starts out talking about birth. And look at this. That this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom. And that government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not perish from the earth. Get this down. Here's what Lincoln's saying. He's saying this war is so bloody and so painful because this war... It's like natural human birth. This war is giving birth to a new nation in which all men will be created equal. And he said it's bloody and it's painful. Just like natural birth. That's what Lincoln said in the Gettysburg Address. Do you understand that? Do you, under, do you know more about the Gettysburg Address than you did when we've accomplished our mission? But I, I suggest this to students. You get yourself, and you can get it anywhere. They fall out of the sky. Hold your hands out and say, get his burger dress and a couple of copies and float down from heaven. But go online and get that. And sometime just in the quiet of the day, when you're all by yourself, and your phone is shut off, and you're not on Facebook, 
read the Gettysburg Address and read it one line at a time and read that line. It just takes you 10 minutes. Read that one line and sit down and think about what you just read. I've been teaching the Gettysburg Address for 43 years. And every time I read it and every time I teach it, it means more to me. I taught it this morning, first hour. It means more to me, fifth hour, than it did first hour. That's the kind of speech it is. It may be the greatest oration in history. And you know how much education Lincoln had? He'd have given anything to be like you and me. We sit in these classrooms half bored out of our skulls. Oh. He'd have given anything to have the opportunity that you and I had. He probably was in school in his whole life three months. Three months. And he wrote those words. Let me tell you something. You could have, you could, you could assemble the English department of Harvard, Yale, and the University of Oklahoma. You could put them in a room and you could say, we're going to give you five years and you've got to come up with something as beautiful as that. And they couldn't do it on their best day. And a guy that never went to the second grade wrote that. You know why Lincoln was such a great writer? Because like all great writers, he read. He read. If you want to be a great writer, read. I'll tell you something else about reading. If you don't read, you're not educated. You may get a diploma that says you, you may get a college degree. But if you don't read, and I'm talking about substantial things, if you don't read, you're not educated, and you never will be. Don't do that. All you will have, listen to me, all you will have is a piece of paper that says you're educated. We've got a library down there of substantial books. You ought to go pick up one and start reading. I'm not talking about these stupid little murder mysteries. I'm talking about something substantial. Anyway, that won't be on the test. That's just free. Bad advice is just, it's just re, re All right, well, let's go on. 1864. Let's go to 1864 very quickly. <clears throat> All right, I think I've got time to do what I want to do. We're going to take our little stretch break a little bit early, though. You're doing good, but get up and stretch. Everybody, quickly. Not a request. Stretch. And hold on to your hats because we're going to fly here. All right, have a seat. All right, in 1864, <clears throat> get this down. In 1864, now I'm going to go pretty fast here, so I spent more time than I, but it's time well spent. Like I say, if all we did was to get his current address and you actually understood it, it would be worth an entire year in a history class. You may not believe that, but it's true. Uh, in 1864, which is the bloodiest year of the war, Lincoln finally found a general who would fight. And here he is up on the board. Who is this? This is the man that saved America. That's what he's called. Who is that? Going once. Going twice. He wins the Civil War. Joshua Champion. Who? Joshua Champion. No. No. That's an educated guess. How tall are you? 6'2". 6'2". You just gave a uh, wrong answer. How are you feeling? You, you, well, no, no. Well, that, that's wrong. That's horrible. You know, if you don't give wrong answers, you'll never be educated. You're still six two. Yes, sir. I haven't shot anybody since breakfast. No, sir. Well, they just gave a wrong answer. Okay. Well, good. I've given more wrong answers in my life than I've given right ones. It won't hurt you one bit. Anyway, that is Hiram Ulysses Grant. People call him Ulysses S. Grant. That's wrong. Wasn't you, Ulysses S. Uh, Hiram, Ulysses Grant, write him down. And, you know, it's 1864. The war, Ulysses Grant, the war had been going on for nearly three years now. And every general, almost every general that Lincoln sent out against uh, Lee, Lee whipped him. But this guy going to whip Lee, okay, and he's going to win the war. So get this down. Grant is appointed the commander in chief of the, well, the commander of the entire Union Army. He's in charge of the whole thing. There's not a soldier, a Union soldier, a U.S. soldier anywhere in the United States that isn't under the command of Grant. 
At this time, get this down, there were two main Confederate armies left. Two, could not, two Confederate armies left. Get this down. Now look at this. Here they are. One army is in Richmond. Confederate army. It's got about 50,000 men. Who's, who's in command of that army? Lee. Who? Lee. Write that down. Lee is in Richmond. And the other... The, la the other remaining Confederate army is here in Atlanta. You with me? Atlanta. And I'll just, well, you wouldn't know that. Uh, but anyway, write this down. This army in Atlanta is un uh, under the command of this guy. So there are two Confederate armies. Lee's in command of the army. You with me? Lee, you, Lee's in command of the army in Richmond. He's got about 50, 60,000 men. And this guy, Joseph E. Johnston, who I think was one of the greatest Confederate generals. I think he did that. Charge us out might have won the war. Of course, nobody else thinks that. But anyway, Joseph E. Johnston is in command of Atlanta, the Confederate Army, and he's got about 60,000 men. You with me? So there are the two armies. Lee, Lincoln is real simple when he appoints Grant to, uh, to uh, take over command of the Union Army. He said, Lee is here with 60,000 men. Here's what my notebook would look like. I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you a grant. I'm going to give you 100,000 men. Go after Lee. Lee's got 60,000 men, and he's in Richmond. And Lincoln told him, once you attack Lee, march out of Washington, go south. Once you attack Lee, don't ever let up. Clench onto him like a bulldog, and don't ever let up until his army is destroyed. You understand that? Grant isn't worried about taking territory. He's, he said, as long as there's a Confederate army, the war goes on, and we're going to destroy it. And then, get this down. And by the way, Grant was an alcoholic, cigar smoking alcoholic. Well, what would we think today if we were to warn the president appointed a cigar smoking alcoholic? As president, I mean, as commander of the uh, of the army. But uh, so there's Grant versus Lee, and then write this guy down. That's one of my favorite jokes. William Tecumseh Sherman. His troops called him Uncle Billy. He's a Union commander. He didn't just have red hair; he had carrot top red hair. Look at him. He wore red bow ties. Uncle Billy, they called him. And he was bipolar. In the morning, so was Churchill, by the way. Always go, oh, bipolar. Can't be. Yes, you can. <laughs> uh, he was bipolar. In the morning, he just felt wonderful. In the afternoon, he would be sunk in a deep depression. Of course, in those days, you couldn't go on the, well, the Oprah show. You couldn't go on Dr. Phil and tell the whole country just how bad you had it. So what did Sherman have to do every morning? And get put on it, get up, put on his uniform, put on his hat, go get on his horse and command the army. And he helped win the war. Sherman's going after Johnston. Get that down. Sherman, here's what my notebook would look like. Sherman. A hundred thousand men is going after Johnston. Johnston's got about sixty thousand. Atlanta. Does that make sense to you all? That right there? Yes, talk to me. Yes, it does, okay? And in May of 1864, get this down, these two armies set out. Uncle Billy's marching toward Atlanta. Uncle Billy's coming out of, oops. Uncle Billy's coming out of Nashville. He's marching toward Atlanta. And Grant's coming out of Washington. And he's marching toward Richmond. You know, I told you 1864 is the bloodiest year of the war. This, the fighting is absolutely horrible. And by the way, in the South, they're almost out of everything. Lee's army, think about this, Lee's army, Confederate army, they're so short on food that if we could get in a time machine and go back to Richmond and land in the Confederate army, uh, you would see Confederate soldiers out where they have their horses tied up, picking pieces of corn out of horse manure and boiling it and eating it. Okay, the horses, you had to have the horses, so they got the fresh corn. Then you waited until the horses defecated and you went down after their manure had dried out and you picked the pieces of corn out of it and you boiled that and ate it. 
Yeah. You're ever in an army, you're ever in a situation like that, it's time to put your gun down and run away. Okay, that's how bad they are. So Grant goes after Lee, Johnson goes uh, after, uh, or Sherman goes after Johnson, and it's some of the worst fighting in the war. That's why 1864 is the bloodiest year of the war. And to top it all off, write this down, 1864. 1864 is a presidential election year. Lincoln is running for re-election. I'm going to give you a chance to redeem yourself, Mr. Uh, Amen. What? Amen. Amen. Is that your first name? Last name. Oh, Amen. Amen. Just right. Okay. I'm going to give you. So, how popular do you think Lincoln was at this point? Not very. Popular. Not very. In fact, you know what he told his cabinet. Listen, you know what he told his cabinet in 1864. He said, "I'm going to get beat. They're not going to reelect me." He said that. Uh, uh, I'm going to get beaten. And by the way, get this down. I won't even give you the Democrat. But the Democrats that year, you with me? The Democrats, they were running. And the Democrats said, if you elect us, get this down. If you elect us, we're going to end this war. We're going to stop it. First day we're in power. We're going to make peace with the South. We'll tell the South this. If you want to come back in the Union and keep your slaves, you can. Listen, if you want, if you want to have your own country, you can. We'll do anything it takes, peace at any price. The Democrats said if we win, and Lincoln said, the Democrats are gonna win. And the only thing I can do, Lincoln told this cabinet, the only thing I can do, you with me? The only thing I can do, if that happens, if the Democrats win, is in between the time. The Democrat is elected, and he gets sworn in as president. I'll have to do everything I can to bring this war to an end, but I probably still won't get it done. And if the Democrats had won, this would have been two countries, and slavery would have probably lasted a hundred more years. So that's what it's is at stake. Everybody, Lincoln, everybody from Lincoln on down believes he's going to get beaten. But then, now look at this. You got to make yourself a little timeline. I'm never going to ask you these dates, but this will help you keep up with it. The fighting starts, you know, May 1864. Lincoln in the summer of 1864 says, I've got to get beaten. But on September 1st, we call that Labor Day today, 1864, get this down, something happened that reassured Lincoln's re-election. Get this down. Who captured Atlanta? Um, Sherman. Sherman. Yeah. Excellent. Write that down. Sherman captured Atlanta. Listen, and when Atlanta fell, there was wild rejoicing in the North. For the first time, they felt they were winning the war and it was almost over. And by the way, the Confederates had to get out of Atlanta so fast that they had all these warehouses full of supplies and they didn't want it to fall into the hands of Sherman's men, so they set it on fire. You know, Sherman to this day, Sherman to this day is blamed with burning Atlanta. Never did it. The Confederates set their own town on fire. Sherman came in and he put his troops to put the fire out. He saved Atlanta. But to this very day, if you go down to Atlanta to some sports bar and you jump up on a table with your mug of beer and say, let's have three cheers for good old Uncle Billy Sherman. Some big Georgia redneck peckerwood will come in and dot your eye because they still hate Sherman. Coming in. He didn't burn Atlanta. He saved it. But when Atlanta fell, the North felt we're going to win this war. And who did they elect president in November of 1864? Who won? Lincoln. Write that down. The fall of Atlanta. Uncle Billy Sherman saved Lincoln. And now, guess what? The South knew that it was going to, listen, the South knew it was going to be a fight to the very bitter end, to the bitter end. And Sherman, get this down. And all this while, Grant's fighting against Lee up here, and he can't break into Richmond. But Sherman uh, rest his army up in what was left of Atlanta, for a few weeks, 
And then he starts marching south. Get this down. Look, look at this blue line here. Everybody, everybody stop writing. I'll repeat one. But I want you to see this. It doesn't do you a bit of good if you don't know what you're. There's Atlanta, and he's going to march all, he's going to march all the way down to the coast here from Atlanta to Savannah. Okay? To from Atlanta to Savannah, Georgia. And of course, he didn't take any supplies with him. It's the fall of the year. So it's part of the year that we're in now. And all those smokehouses all across Georgia were just crammed full of smoked meat. And Sherman and his men get this down. They get this. He's got 100,000 men. They're going to spread out on a front. He's going to spread those men out on a front 60 miles wide. 60 miles wide. And they're going to go through the heart of Georgia like a swarm of locusts. Get this down. They're going to burn bridges, telegraphs. Get all this, factories. There's no Confederate army to stop them now. And by the way, this may be the best fed army that ever marched. Do you know how much food it takes to feed 100,000 men a day? 300 tons of food. That's what they stole. They stripped the South, they left the South spark. They burned towns and plantations. They burned up four years' worth of cotton. The South couldn't ship their cotton out during the war. They burned up four years' worth of cotton. They destroyed the South. Sherman said, I'm going to show the Southern people that their own government can't protect them, and people will not support a government that can't protect them. So he marched across Georgia. And Georgia, by the way, this is, get this down. This is Sherman's march to the sea. And Georgia never forgave him for that. And then he turns... Once he gets to Savannah, he reaches Savannah by Christmas Day, and then he turns north and he heads for South Carolina. And if you think they were bad on Georgia, what they did in Georgia was relatively light compared to what they did to South Carolina. Why are they so angry at South Carolina? It was in the first day. Firstly, they said South Carolina started this. We're going to make South Carolina howl. And they burned South Carolina too. And I don't reckon South Carolina's ever forgiven. So look at the situation. We're almost out of time today. But look at the situation. By, yeah, we are. About by 1865. Get this down. And we'll finish this tomorrow after your test. Well, I got close to what I wanted to do. Look. Lee's up here with about 40,000 men now. Grant has Lee pinned down in, in front of Richmond. They're picking corn out of horse manure to eat. That's how bad they are. Grant has him surrounded with 100,000 men, and Sherman is coming up with the South. Lee's got about 40,000 men, and he knows that before long, he will face 200,000 men. And so in April, this is where we'll stop today. In April, get this down, in April of 1865, Lee evacuated Richmond. He left. You with me? Look. Let's go to this better map. Oh, rat. This, uh, I hate it. Uh, I hate you. There's Richmond. Here's Sherman coming up from the Carolinas. Grant has him surrounded. Lee sees that he can no longer hold. He said, we've got to escape. And Lee leaves Richmond, heading west, trying to outrun the Union Army. Grant comes into Richmond. He didn't. They didn't stop to celebrate. Grant didn't even change his clothes. He just uh, got on his horse. He his favorite horse was Cincinnati, and the army just goes right through Richmond, chasing Lee. They say we've got to get around in front of Lee and stop him. And if we get around in front of him, you know, as he's heading west, it's like this. Here goes Lee, just a second. And here's the Union Army. They said, if we get around in front of him, we'll have him surrounded and he'll have to surrender and the war will be over. And they got around in front of him, write this date down. Well, I'll talk more about this coming tomorrow. But they finally got around in front of Lee on April uh, 9th, 1865. It was a Sunday. April 9th, 1865. At a little place, write that down, and that's easy to spell. Appomattox Courthouse. Get this down. Look, 
It's just a new word. People see a new word and they automatically decide if you can spell apo and you can spell mat and you can spell tox, you can spell it. And all you can do that, every one of them. Appomattox Courthouse. And that's where the American blood is going to end. And we'll talk all about the end of the war. Come tomorrow after your test. Now listen to me. You take those notebooks home tonight and you sit down for 45 minutes and you read your notes. You've got to learn the material. If you don't learn Appomattox Courthouse, you're not going to do very well. So you do that tonight. And you'll come in here and knock this out of the park, and you won't even have to worry about this little old drinky dink kissing class. All right. Questions? No, sir. No, sir. Uh, was Sherman a union or a confederate? He's union. Okay, that's what I thought. I just heard yes. Uh, where's the test going? Fort Sumter. Fort Sumter. I will. Oh, yes, I've had people do that. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. You're